Hello, and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast, where we bring the industry buzz right to your ears. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, and today we've got an extraordinary guest shaping the future of manufacturing with a touch of digital magic. But first, a quick reminder, don't forget to check us out at manufacturingculturepodcast.com. You'll find blogs, link to our sponsors and partners, and now swag. If you want a sweatshirt or hat like the ones I have on, check it out today. Also, make sure to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and even TikTok for the latest updates. And hey, here's a great moment to give a massive shout out to our sponsor, Spironi, for their ongoing support. Now, on to our guest, who I happen to have worked with a long time ago and have recently reconnected with. Folks, hold on to your hats because we've got Nikki Gonzalez in the virtual studio. And if I remember correctly, and I can see by above her head, she does love her hats. Nikki is the dynamic head of partnerships at QuoteBeam, an industrial automation procurement platform that's revolutionizing how we think about manufacturing efficiency. But that's not it. She is also the co-host of the popular podcast, Automation Ladies, where she stirs up some serious tech talk. With a career spanning 15 years, over 15 years, Nikki has been at the forefront of optimizing manufacturing and supply chains. Her secret weapon, a blend of data, automation, and an unwavering commitment to excellence. But Nikki's not just about numbers and processes. She's on a mission to make our industry more inclusive and welcoming. From the factory floor to the executive boardroom, she's a force for change, championing diversity and opening doors for new voices in the world of manufacturing. So gear up for an electrifying conversation as we dive into the world of automation, explore the power of partnerships, and discover how Nikki is driving a revolution in manufacturing. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, Nikki, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I think out of all the guests that I've had so far on the podcast, I've known you the longest, even though there was maybe a 12 to 13 year like lapse yeah. of communication in there. Uh Technically, I've known you the longest out of every guest that I've had on here. Uh, So I'm super excited to talk with you, uh, hear your story, where you've been over the last 15 years. Um, So typically, I start conversations with my guests talking about their cultural journey in the manufacturing industry. Um, And I want to hear that from you. I want to hear where your career has been, where, where you feel the industry is now culturally and where your, your career is culturally and, and where do you see the industry getting to as, as we progress uh, through into the future of, of the industry? Yeah. Um, by the way, I just want to say props for doing this podcast on this subject because it's not something that we, I mean, we talk about, right. But um, openly, you know, in this type of setting uh, not so much, right. Yeah, And uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak on it. Um, Absolutely. So you met me at at the early part of my career. Um, Although if anybody, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, um, by the way, which is the best place to find me after the show, one of my pinned posts is uh, kind of the the early story of how I got to be. And I'll try to keep it more concise than that. Um, (laughs) And then that tells you a little bit about me. LinkedIn has a, a post character limit. And I yes. think I told two portions of that story so far, and I still didn't get to finish it. So we'll see if we get okay. through it on the episode today. All right. Uh, I like it. No, but we we crossed paths. Yeah. On my first real job out of college, uh, I started, though, working for my dad when I was in middle school. And okay. um, so I kind of grew up in that small business, um, figuring things out, always, you know, my dad's an electrical engineer, but an entrepreneur. And I have that bug, too, um, somehow. And so I started working for him. Uh, I liked it a lot more than babysitting. Um, Answering the phone and talking to adults was easier than dealing with kids. Um, So when I was about 14, uh, I started working for him doing, you know, everything I could think of. And I really gravitated towards kind of people uh, facing positions, right? Whereas my sister, for instance, same upbringing, you know, same genes. She just wants to solder in the back of the house. So 
I got to I got a chance to try out all kinds of things. I did accounting; it bored me to death. Um, I wrote user manuals. I went to trade shows. I answered the phone. I cleaned the office. Um, and so I got super lucky just to be able to kind of try out almost anything I was interested in. Yeah. Uh, and it was a small enough business as there was always something that needed to get done. And if somebody volunteered to do it, great, right? Even if it was a 14-year-old uh, <laughs> working in public here like, with no skills, <laughs> it's better than nothing. Um, and I, I ended up, you know, seeing my dad was kind of my role model. I took AP physics and, you know, was pretty decent at math, but I really excelled at the people skills. So I ended up going to business school. I also saw my dad, you know, as being the CEO of his own business at this point. Mm -hmm. And, but I really still, you know, think like an engineer, I problem solve. Um, and I think I learned a lot, a lot of that from my dad. So I found myself in the world of sales engineering. Thankfully, I didn't really know about it um, until I needed to get a job. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I have this international business degree. Um, I'm originally from Iceland and I moved to England before I moved to Texas when I was a kid. So I just thought, you know, I love travel. I love working with people from different places. International business must be for me. Yeah. Um, the tricky part about international business, it's, it's a kind of a generic business degree that teaches you a little bit about a lot of things and then how to do them internationally, <laughs> which is great when you're, you know, in the C-suite, but Nobody takes a first year intern and says, now go do international business. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, so a, that's not a job that. description you can just uh, apply for, right? It's not something no. you can search for on LinkedIn or Indeed, right? Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. And there's nobody on the campus recruiting portal going, I want an international <laughs> you know, business degree holder person. Uh, so I got lucky and kind of found out that there are hybrid business technical roles like yeah. uh, technical recruiting, which I'm really glad I didn't get into. Um, I did apply for one of those. Technical marketing, which is one that I probably would have had fun with as well. Um, and then technical sales. And I, okay. I entered what's commonly known in the industry as Keynes University for my <laughs> continued education after I graduated. And I, you know, interestingly enough, in that one of those first interviews, I at the time did not know, but now in hindsight, realize that I had the perfect kind of red flag slash opportunity to know that this wasn't for me necessarily, um, which is one of the interview questions they asked me was, and they geared this towards school because I think most people coming to these jobs don't have real world job experience. Right. But they said, if you, could, if you could choose a professor that you know, gives you a big project and then just makes it due at the end of the year, or would you like one that gives you you know, small assignments and tests every week leading up to the project at the end of the year. Uh, you know, which one would you choose? And I had had a number of years working at my dad's company at this point, you know, doing everything pretty much independently. And so I answered, well, I would ha be happy to just take the project be due at the end of the year and I'll do it at my own pace. And they said, well, that is an answer, but it's not the answer we're looking for. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. And, and then <laughs> He, he explained to me, um, you know, here we things are very structured. We have, you know, we don't just let you run with your own thing. Um, and so we like people that are very uh, system. I forget how they explained it exactly. But basically, like, sure. you better be open to micromanagement because that's what we do. <laughs> uh, and yes. at the time I thought about this and, you know, good or bad decision on my part. I don't regret it in any way. But I thought to myself, huh, okay. Well, and then I, I told the interviewer, I said, you know what? I can do anything. I can succeed anywhere. So I haven't tried that before, but let me try that. <laughs> and I tried it for about three years and I mm -hmm. found that it wasn't for me, um, but it was a very valuable experience to work under that type of culture, um, which doesn't necessarily uh, value your contributions as an individual, rather your ability to come in and follow the system that they've put in place. Correct. Which for some individuals, I think is a great fit. Um, yeah. And for others, maybe not so much, right? Pe particularly people that are a bit entrepreneurial, <laughs> that have a personality, that like to do their own thing, um, establish relationships with people. Um, that, that sort of, you know, I found it wasn't quite the way I enjoy working. Um, yeah. But I did get a fantastic education in factory automation, uh, sensors, machine vision is what I did. So that was... Uh, tickled all my problem solving, you know, uh, 
things, whatever, things that I needed, right? I, yeah. I love to go out there and help people solve complex problems. Um, and I did find that sales engineering was a, a really attractive, you know, field for me because it combined those two things. Um, yeah. But I did stick around for about three years until I, you know, kind of finally realized that I was probably not getting as much out of it any, anymore. For a while, I stuck around mostly because the product, you know, release schedule was pretty fast. And I was fascinated yeah. by the technology and really interested in continuing to solve the problems. Um, but then when I did finally, you know, you get a lot of recruiter calls uh, in those positions. And that was also the kind of the beginning of LinkedIn. I remember coming out of college, yeah. it was brand new and getting the advice like, oh, make yourself a profile and put your, you know, put your experience <laughs> on there. It's like a digital resume. <laughs> And then I started to understand, you know, or get calls from recruiters and things. Um, and I really made my first move based on a recruiter uh, contacting me off of LinkedIn and me thinking about, is it a better culture fit uh, mm. than what I'm currently sitting with? And of course, I found out in a lot of ways, the grass is always greener. Every organization has its own problems. Um, yeah. But I did get out of that micromanaging type of environment. I wouldn't call it, ex you know, extreme extreme micromanagement, but there's a certain, you know, the Japanese process and the way is, is a bit mm -hmm. different than what, you know, Americans may be used to. So then I probably went to the other side, which is German company, <laughs> um, which I found myself in a very, you know, different type of way of running a company and, you know, focus and things like that. And uh, full of wonderful people, the culture was a better fit for me. Um, but ultimately throughout, you know, my sort of testing the waters here and there, um, after that experience, I worked for another German company, and I found myself getting some frustrated with some of the, you know, cultural differences and time zone differences and having headquarters out of Germany um, sure. and having to communicate and get decisions and buy in from uh, a different type of organization and mindset, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. Also things on different timelines, right? I was in Silicon Valley, where things move pretty quickly, especially when it comes to technology. Um, you know, electronics manufacturing, you're going to, your product's going to be obsolete by the time somebody in Germany <laughs> makes a decision. So I actually jumped out uh, kind of on my own in, what was it, 2016. And I had been living in the Bay Area at this point for uh, several years. I drive by all the billboards for Salesforce and, you know, the cloud and Slack and HubSpot and, you know, all of these new softwares for doing things using data analytics and all of that. And um, I'm a very curious person. I had a hard time thinking about, okay, I, there's all this stuff out there that I could potentially use to do my job better. Um, but my management is not interested in that right now, or, you know, timing is not good, whatever reason, I'm not in charge of those things. Um, so I really wanted to figure out what the heck does startup land look like? And yeah even working for an American company. At this point, I had never worked for an American company. Good point. Uh, and so I went out and, and left my job and started consulting and just kind of like, I tried to find startups that I could work for, uh, mostly for the experience of trying to figure out what what's a good fit for me. What can I learn from how these companies are setting up their tech stacks, how they're approaching sales and marketing differently. Um, and I ended up doing what, one founder uh, explained to me is startup shopping, which is working a little bit for a lot of them until I find one that I really want to work for. Um, and I ended up working for full time after, you know, a few different sort of contract engagements and things like that. I actually got two full time job offers in the same week from two different startups, one hardware, one software. Um, All right. So I was like, do I make the decision right? What, what do I do? And I ended up working for a software startup out of Detroit, Michigan. Um, so that was the first American company I ever worked for. Uh, wow. and I was the first non-engineering hire. So I developed all of the sales and marketing um, collateral, tried to build a brand, go out there, represent us at conferences. Um, and that's where I really kind of found, I guess, part of my skill set really is the strength of, of kind of being involved at a few different levels and then being able to speak about that to the right audiences. Um, very much working with different departments. I have a hard time sticking in my lane and I love to learn everything. Um, but I found that the startup culture, you know, it's it's terrible and grinding in a lot of ways, but it's also full of opportunity because you can yeah. make it what you want, especially when you're you know, involved in the early stage. Um, 
And I ended up leaving that job uh, out of sort of necessity when my daughter was born. Um, she decided <laughs> she's in a hurry like me. Um, she decided to come <laughs> like seven weeks early. I was at a, uh, an artificial intelligence conference presenting in Santa Clara when my water broke. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. So, and I had only planned to take like four weeks off and I hadn't planned to do that for another six weeks. <laughs> so all my plans went out the window and I ended up, you know, with, with a premature baby, I wasn't going back to working, you know, 14, 16 hour days in the tech industry. Um, right. So I pieced out of that for a while and wanted to do something that was more flexible for having, you know, a family. We moved up to Seattle because I had, you know, no support system or family around in the Bay Area other than work. Yeah. And I had two kids. Um, COVID threw another sort of <laughs> big wrench into my life uh, because we had started, a, my husband and I, a real estate business and a vending machine business all of which were very much location-based and got shut down repeatedly uh, with the, the state of Washington, the way that they right. did things. And so we ended up moving back to Texas a couple of years ago. Um, but the long story short there is that a past connection of mine, who I used to work with at Festo, uh, Roman Peach, who is now the founder and CEO of Quotebeam, uh, we worked together while we were at Festo, and then he went to go work for Apple, uh, and he ran iPhone operations at Apple for a few years. And um, we had stayed in touch during that time when I was working at uh, Algo, which was that AI supply chain startup. Um, and he was at Apple and he had gone to Stanford and met our CTO and co-founder, Andrew Kaur, at the time. Okay. And they started a company at Stanford and kind of, you know, kept it to nights and weekends, side gig uh, for a few years. And then during COVID, they decided to um, take it full time, get funding and launched this company called Quotebeam. And I had been talking to him about it for, you know, a few years. I loved the idea. Personally, I think, you know, the the need for marketplaces now that we have the infrastructure in the internet, the connections around the world, and the ability to bring some transparency and, you know, matching customers with vendors or technologies or any of that, right? There's a ton of inefficiency in the old, I'm going to knock on your door and do you take my call? And that's how you know about my product and or end up using what I have to sell. Yeah. Um, not to take away from the relationship, you know, part of business, but information wise, yeah. us doing that in a vacuum 100 times a day just never seemed very efficient to me. I mean, we sold yeah. automation to be more efficient, but we, you know, still did it by cold calling people asking them if they have time next Monday at nine o'clock for me to pop by their office, you know, kind of how many thing. calls did we have to make? I, I forget. 80 before 10, if I remember yeah, correctly. <laughs> I think so. I think you're right. It, it was uh, an was 40 ask before 10 or 80, 80 on a Monday, you know, kind of a situation, yeah. but we were looking at, yeah, probably close to a hundred to 200. And that was before we had power dialers and all that, right. We're just like Absolutely. sitting there with our finger. How many times um, did you call uh, for time and temperature? Because that's how I got around it a lot. Once I had my next week already completely booked, I would just call time and temperature like dozens of times over yeah. and over and over again. I never did because when I joined, I got warned uh, of all the people that got fired from calling uh, movie <laughs> phone during their lunch break. <laughs> so I, I did not get fired. <laughs> my stance was um I don't care about the point ranking, which was, you know, not necessarily in my benefit. Sure. Pay wise, um, and you know, a lot of other things. In an organization that really values those sorts of metrics, right? Activity metrics, I didn't yeah. cater to those metrics, right? I right. would take my phone call from a customer support call on my cell phone and I would keep it there rather than transferring it to the office phone to make sure I get credit for the minutes, those sorts of things, right? Right. Um because I'm just not money motivated. It's just not one of those things that like, I'm not competitive. Um, and I don't think about, you know, closing the big deal doesn't give me the satisfaction. It's seeing the line run that gives me yeah. the satisfaction. So personally, that's just not how I'm motivated. Sure. Um, <laughs> that makes total sense. Yeah. I, I, Roman called me up and, and, you know, the timing was perfect. I was needing to, you know, we were planning to move away from Washington. Um, COVID had, you know, unfortunately been hard on our family. Um, we lost some people. My father-in-law, you know, retired. He lost his job at Alaska Airlines. Oh. Um, so it couldn't have been more perfect timing. Roman reached out, said, hey, we're starting this company. Um, you know all about it. Are you ready to come work for us? Because uh, <laughs> we've been talking about it for years. There's a whole lot of backstory to this. But 
Um, honestly, I, I have to say that, A, if it had been Roman, um, and Roman, if you're listening to this, you know that this is not a negative story. <laughs> but if it had been Roman, like, circa 10 years ago, I would have possibly said no to this. Because okay. culture-wise, um, now, you know, I've grown up, right? I've had 15 years in the industry. I've had a couple kids. I've, you know, started businesses. And I got to the realization um, during that time when I started my real estate business that I no longer want to do business with people that I don't enjoy spending time with. And I had yeah. been in that sales position. You know, you have a territory, you have a quota. I've sat at a lot of lunches, been in a lot of meetings where I smiled and nodded and kept my mouth shut about stuff that personally I would have preferred to say something or leave the room, right? Those sorts of things. Yeah. And it was liberating to be in that position, right? When I started sure. my real estate business, I also ran into a ton of people in real estate that I was like, I never want to see this person again if I can help it. And so I chose to make that one of the core parts of my business was I need to feel comfortable with everyone around me, um, enjoy doing business with them. And if I don't, there's plenty of other fish in the sea. There's plenty of other you know deals out there, people to meet, properties to buy, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Um, and I think part of you know being able to, have that attitude comes with some experience and age and independence. Um, but thinking about, okay, coming back into the tech world, startups, mm -hmm. industrial automation in particular, the manufacturing industry, um, after having spent time in, you know, what you would call Silicon Valley startup land, traditional yeah. manufacturing is not exactly a hot place to be. <laughs> um, but I had the opportunity to, be the employee number one at this new company, right? It's Silicon Valley based. It has the backing of the investors. You know, it has uh, our CTO, Andrew is a whiz, right? From, from, uh, from Stanford. But Roman and I come from this industrial automation background. Right. And a huge thing that made me want to join the company and help them build this is that I saw Roman's progression, um, as a person and as a manager, uh, after he went to Apple and, you know, A, took on a lot more responsibility there running, you know, a huge department, right? That's billions of dollars in spare parts and, you know, Absolutely. production for all the iPhones, all the lines, right? But the other thing is he worked with a lot more women at Apple than he ever had in, in our world. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take some sort of class or a training to tell him that, hey, maybe he could change and, you know, it took him actually working with women and having his own realizations that, you know, we had this conversation at some point later, he's like, yeah, you know what, looking back on, you know, my time as an engineer, now some of the stuff that I heard or particip like not participated in, right, but was around and condoned, now I just feel uncomfortable in that situation Absolutely. and I would want to leave. And I don't want my company to be built that way. And so the whole process of us deciding, hey, are we going to work together on this company? Of mm -hmm. course, a lot of it was me vetting, you know, the, the opportunity and do I think this company really can grow and all that stuff. But the main thing for me was what type of company culture are you trying to build? Because being employee number one, I play a huge role in that. And I'm going to be responsible to every single person that joins us after me. Because uh, if I'm representing this company, I need to feel comfortable and know that people coming into it are going to be treated right. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked Roman too, like, you know, what? What are you trying to get out of this? Are you just trying to you know, build a big company and get rich and make money? Or do you want to sell it out in five years? You know, something like this will get acquired in a hot second if it ever works. Um, and he told me that he really wants to run a company where people feel happy to come work every day. Mm. It provides for their families and they want to be there. Um, and that was a huge part of his commitment as to why he even wanted to start a company um, in the first place. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the big reasons why I came on board. Um, that's awesome. And in a nutshell, that's kind of what brought me to where I am now. I, you know, joined this company a couple of years ago while in the middle of all kinds of personal crap moving across yeah. the country. Um, I've moved a few times since then. Uh, I've had to take bereavement leave three times. Oh. You know, none of this has been fun, but I couldn't have done it. I honestly couldn't have survived all of that. I don't think uh, if it hadn't been, you know, working in this type of environment where I know people um, and the company support me. And then, yeah, I started this podcast uh, with my partner in crime, <laughs> Allie G, or Alicia Hi, Gilpin, Allie. who started her own company. Um, and really, yeah, we do that as part of, I guess we're both lucky enough to have kind of made it to this point, right? 
we stuck around in the industry long enough. We now have, you know, a really thick skin. Um, but I don't want to go out there and tell other women just to have a thick skin to make it. Yeah. Right. I think we're, we now, you know, are in this position where we have a little bit of responsibility to try to continue what's already, you know, people have already been working hard to make some changes in our industry and to just make it clear that culture really matters. Yeah. Um, and, and all those good things. I love it. So, so many questions. Um, <laughs> the, the role that women play in manufacturing, uh, that's an entire subset of our population that has been ignored in this industry for so long and, and almost minimized. I mean, I, I remember when I first got into the industry uh, 20 plus years ago, and it was women were playing the role of marketing and accounting and uh, receptionist, right? I didn't see hardly any leaders who were women. I didn't see hardly any uh, individual contributors out on f the floor who were women, right? So uh, in that evolution of the role in, in women uh, in manufacturing, what, what do you think has been one of the biggest parts or, or drivers to that in your opinion well i think um women being encouraged to go to college and us you know going for it uh we really are graduating in a lot of these programs at, at higher rates than men now oh absolutely um, which means yeah there's more talent in the pipeline of women that come in um the disturbing part is a lot of them graduate and then but but it's like it's like a uh, what do you, what do you call those classes in college that everybody takes that are super hard just to fail people out kind of, Oh yeah. Um, lead out classes or something we, like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. A woman's entire career journey is kind of like that. <laughs> just like okay. at every level, we just drop out, drop out, drop out. And so you, you end up with, you think of a, a marketing funnel, right? Yeah. It's kind of like that. You have this many candidates at the top of the funnel and then who actually gets to the top and, or to the bottom. Right. And you yeah. would call that like a leadership position. Yeah. Um, not only are we starting off with too small of a base in the funnel to begin with, mm -hmm. um, but then we're just filtering ourselves out or, or the industry or whatever, right, is, is filtering us out at every level. But we have like just more and more of them are coming in, right? So even mm -hmm. with all that filtering out, we still end up with more women in the workforce, in these types of roles, in STEM related roles, I guess I would call it. Uh, yeah. Although... Same could be said about sales, for instance, which is not a STEM related role at all, right? Right, um, right. And if I think about the handful of women that I've known in that role uh, over over those years that I've done it, um, not all of them are doing it anymore. Um, yeah. Some of them have dropped out of the workforce altogether. Some of them dropped out of the industry completely to do something else. Um, so part of it is to look at, okay, we complain and we say that there's not enough women, uh, in the candidate pool when we want to hire women. Right. Um, but then we don't necessarily make it easy for them to stick around either. Uh, right. so what has changed? I mean, I think just the sheer force of numbers will cause a change, right? If more and more women are graduating and I think big tech has played a little bit of a role, right? So I mentioned that, you know, he saw that change going from a industrial automation company going to Apple. All of a sudden he worked with a ton more women in leadership. Yeah. Even though the software industry, the high tech industry, the big tech companies all have this, you know, imbalance, they still have more than we do in the manufacturing industry in these yeah. types of roles. Um, and I don't know, honestly, you know, I'm not an expert at what's been working. Why are there more women now? Uh, I think part of it is too that like, you know, with the, with the internet and just being connected, right. And the younger generation coming up, right. I'm a millennial. Um, right. I kind of grew up with the start of knowing people professionally all over the place. Um, y kids younger than us, they just, they see these things and they don't see barriers or differences like we used to in the past, not knowing what was sure. out there, what was different. Um, so I, I really, you know, can't necessarily speak to what works, but I think also just by, again, sheer, numbers if men are now more likely to potentially be working with a woman in some of these positions sure well and I think and I, you know are gonna just by by osmosis or whatever you learn as that's that's one of the powers of connecting with other people getting to know other cultures you know diversity is you as your your mind and your horizons expand you know 
you really do change. Um, and I think we're seeing some of that, you know, it's a, it's an effect that takes a while. Uh, it's definitely got a lagging effect, Yeah. but it is showing that there, you know, you, you will have these changes and part of it is, I wish we didn't have to talk about it. Right. I think everybody kind of does, right. Both yeah. the people that think that it doesn't matter. They don't want to hear about it. Those of us right. that want the change, we don't really want to be talking about it. Um, we'd rather it just happened. Yeah. And I hate talking about women stuff, women and blah, 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 to be honest. <laughs> like, it's just not my favorite topic. Um, but it does have to happen. And right. uh, well, this is the only question about that. Uh, <laughs> just the, 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 I'll, let, I'll let that be the only question that, that I ask. Um, I will say uh, somebody that knows you, uh, Alex Marcy, um, I love his take on how he built that more inclusive workforce uh, at his company, uh, yeah. going to conferences and, and looking around the room and just noticing and talking with his wife and his wife saying, they're out there. You just have to be more intentional in finding them, right? And and I think he's done a great job in, in going out and finding women uh, and the most qualified person, man or woman, for with the roles that he's looking for. So I, I, I appreciate that in him. Uh, Nikki, uh, you you talked about LinkedIn and and what it used to be when you first jumped on, right? It was mm -hmm. this pro professional platform. It was a walking resume that just followed you. Um, there weren't, you know, a whole lot of other things that happened on LinkedIn in uh, the late two thousands, other than looking for a job or posting, you know, a new position. LinkedIn has changed dramatically over the last 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. And you are somebody who does LinkedIn very well. For somebody who doesn't necessarily like talking about themselves, you do it very well in a very humble, very uh, modest way. Talk, uh, talk to you. us about, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I take notes from you every time I see a post, I'm like, oh, that was a great one. Um, talk to us about your process with, with social media and, and what that's done for your personal brand and, and uh, what you are able to get out there to the masses. Okay. Mm. I don't really have uh, a method to this at all. I, okay. I show up there. And yeah. I show up pretty much only there, which allows me, you know, the luxury of, I guess, interacting more than I would if I spent any other time, let's say, on other types of social media. Sure. Um, so, and I, and I do it because, uh, well, okay, let me back up. Like I said before, uh, when I came out of college, LinkedIn was new and it was like, put your resume on LinkedIn. And then I was in the sales role. Um, and so I started to kind of connect with people that I met, whether I, you know, customers that I met at sales calls or uh, people I would meet at trade shows. Uh, I figured out that, hey, LinkedIn is a pretty good way to keep tabs on people. Um, let's say I, you know, know somebody and they move to another company, right? That's kind of a warm lead for me, right? An engineer in a particular automation role um, or maintenance role, they may move to a manufacturer down the street, but they're probably gonna be doing something similar. This is a great way for me to kind of get back in touch with people um, without having to cold call them. So I just thought, uh, I never used it extensively for prospecting or anything. I just thought, hey, great idea to connect with people that I've met in person sure. here on LinkedIn. Um, so over the years, I ended up amassing probably about 7,000 something connections on wow. LinkedIn just from that, right? So these were not people that I didn't know. I mean, I think I probably would accept some you know, invitations from people in the industry or recruiters or whatever. Uh, but for the most part, it was people that I had met along the way. Yeah. Um, and in, then when I came back to, so I, I, in, when I had the baby, I kind of just completely shut everything off in terms of uh, professional social, like LinkedIn um, tech industry. I stopped reading all the, you know, machine learning papers and things like that. And I got heavily into real estate and investing and running small businesses and things like that. And mm -hmm. it turns out a lot of that content is actually on Facebook. Facebook groups are apparently where it's at for local real estate networks, meetups, um, okay. things like that. And so I became heavily kind of invested in that. I was trying to learn my local real estate market. 
I got to know all about, you know, uh, non-QM lending and how investments work and taxes and uh, corporate structures and all these different things, right? Just, and and Facebook is a great place for that. And I started just yeah. amassing these connections. And if I would go on Facebook, yes, it's like my family from Iceland and my little cousins, and then just <laughs> real estate, real estate, real estate, right? When, <laughs> when I came to Quilt Beam, um, A, I was like, I don't have room for all this real estate in my brain anymore. <laughs> and at some point I logged out of Facebook and all of a sudden, all this, this void in my life appeared where I had, you know, I didn't have a social media. I, per I personally just never, you know, latched onto Instagram or any of these other platforms. Yeah. Um, I think because I'm pretty entrepreneur slash career oriented, if I have extra time, I'm probably going to try to find some way to make money or start a business or learn something, yeah. right? It's just as part of my personality. Um, I get bored, you know, looking at whatever. I don't wear makeup. So like makeup tutorials are not my <laughs> thing to watch. Uh, and I came to LinkedIn, uh, when I started with Quopium and I noticed this new thing all of a sudden, I was like, oh, of course COVID brought real conversations to LinkedIn, yeah. which is kind of what I assume is what happened. But honestly, I was gone when right. it did happen and I jumped back on and, you know, I do have this like, you know, good amount of, of connections, right. But I start seeing people in my feed that are actually producing content about what's going on in the industry, trends, um, different things like that. And I just, I really latched onto it because I enjoy learning. I enjoy trying to understand different things that are going on in my industry, um, understanding different people's pain points. Here we are trying to start a business, right? Um, addressing some of the challenges that I think our industry has when it comes to visibility of inventories during a really tough supply chain time for everybody in industrial automation. Um, but I don't really know, you know, I didn't work with buyers a whole lot, procurement buyers. Um, mm -hmm. I used to work with engineers and then I didn't really know how, you know, the PO part happened. It was just like, <laughs> yeah, we fixed the problem and, you know, somebody ordered. Great. And then and somebody, a PO appears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so where else other than LinkedIn can you literally learn from people in yeah. all kinds of different positions in your industry? Um, that you don't have time to go, you know, knock on their door or call them. And at this point, I was living in McGregor, Texas, which okay. is a small town outside of Waco, where SpaceX tests their rockets. <laughs> and so my house would be taken. Um, wow. And, but I was living in a, in a tiny town, right? Small town life. I would, you know, do my work on the computer and then take my kids out in a walk in a, our red wagon down the street to the Dollar General. Like, wow. Okay. Zero professional network around anywhere in person. But yeah. LinkedIn was the place where I could learn, where I could connect. And so I saw this and I saw people like uh, Aaron Prather and Megan Zimba and Eddie Saunders and, um, you know, Chris Lukey sharing different types of content. Um, Allie G, she was sharing a bunch of YouTube videos about how the inside of a valve works and, you know, just different things that I thought were fascinating. Um, and I enjoyed my feed very, very much. And I was like, you know what? B2B has not caught up with this whole influencer marketing thing. Mm -hmm. And clearly there is appetite for people like me to learn from people on LinkedIn. And where better to do this than a professional social network where you can do what is my dream, which is to talk to people, have relationships around nerdy technical stuff or manufacturing stuff that most people in my real life don't care about at all. Right. And, you know, being in a small company with, we hadn't raised any money at this point, really. Um, so I had no budget. It was just me, myself, and I. Um, and a little known company called Quote Beam that nobody knew about. Nobody knows what they do. You know, most people still don't. Uh, that's my day job up there, by the way. Check them out. Um, I thought, okay, this is something that we need to get in on the ground floor. If, if there's, you know, I think about that first mover advantage. When you give somebody a chance when they're small, right? They hopefully mm -hmm. remember you when they, when they get big kind of a thing. So I just thought, how do I get to know these people and add value to whatever they're doing so that, hey, maybe they'll think of me or maybe I can, you know, be in their orbit, right? So I start showing up to, you know, Jay calls events in the, in the comments, right? And just try to add value, like not throwing, oh, hi, I'm Nikki, cool beam, go buy parts. Right. Right. Um, but I guess I try to try to do what I try to do in, in real life. After I've gotten a bit grown up and matured and feel comfortable with myself, right? If I walk into a networking event, what do I try to do? I try to get to know people, try to find ways that I can add value to them. Sure. Uh, 
And I did that online. I tried, started showing up to other people's events and, you know, add value or something. And I found that to be extremely rewarding and satisfying and people would engage in conversation with me. And then sometimes we would, you know, meet in person or at trade shows. It 100% turned around the trade show experience for me from feeling, um, actually, this kind of goes back to a woman thing, which I try not to, you know, talk about too much, but I honestly had gotten sick of, completely sick of, and never wanted to go to an industry trade show ever again. After really? a couple of experiences at PAC Expo um, and other places where, yeah, you walk up to a booth and you hear derogatory jokes, um, you get, ex you know, mistaken for a booth babe. I mean, there's just, it's not an environment where women feel especially uh, welcome oftentimes. And, right. and I will say that's not a singular experience, right? Everybody's experience is different and it depends on the context and everything. But um, now that I had some of these online friends to go meet up with at trade shows, I felt less alone. Yeah. Um, and I felt more comfortable just being myself there. And uh, yeah, my strategy is really, I don't have a targeted strategy for social media engagement. I try, you know, to kind of bucket it, I usually will, you know, spend some time a little bit in the morning. And then if I really need a break in the afternoon, I try not to be on it all the time. Sure. But at the same time, my plan is not to produce my own content. My plan is to be an active community member to those that are, I know are putting in the effort to create their content. Um, and then my content just kind of comes when I think of something. And oftentimes <laughs> I think of something half-assed and then uh, later I'm like, I probably shouldn't have posted that or I'll put it in the, the schedule for later and then delete it before it ever gets. Uh, <laughs> and I've gotten some great advice, right? If you want advice on how to actually build your social media presence and, you know, create content that people want, uh, I've been told, you know, try different types of content, put them in a spreadsheet, look at what has the most engagement and then do more of that and find something that you have, you know, a unique voice or insight into plan your content, blah, blah, blah. That's it's great. Um, I don't do that though. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Here, here's the, here's what you do, but I don't do any of that. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I people that. that do that and, and it's, you know, it's helpful to them. Yeah. And I can't say, you know, I have, I don't know, 20 something thousand followers. I, maybe I could have more if I was more systematic about it, sure. but um, I'm just at a point now where I prefer quality over quantity. Yeah. And I want to have people that actually want to engage in conversations that I'm interested in. And they range anywhere from, you know, industrial automation to supply chain stuff to, you know, electrical panel jokes. Or uh, I've gotten recently into baking sourdough bread and making kombucha. So I don't know if those two paths will ever cross. But if anybody uh, is into automating fermentation stuff other than breweries, I've always been interested in. Um, but that's another potential crossover. <laughs> All right. I do have a book on making kombucha here somewhere down there. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried that, that once. For me, for me personally, one of the huge draws of LinkedIn um, as a social networking platform is I just prefer to spend my time with people that are driven, that are going somewhere, that are learning, that are challenging themselves. So I consider that to be both online or offline, right? Yeah, I have family and friends from a long time ago that I'll spend time with no matter what. But other than that, I, you know, I try to think of who, who actually lifts me up or vice versa when we spend time together. Sure. And I feel like a lot of the internet kind of has devolved into like a cesspool of negativity and, oh, you know, boy. criticism. And you can just go down rabbit hole after another of all kinds of things in the world that I don't have time for. Um, and I couldn't change if I wanted to or tried. But what I can yeah. change and have some control over is providing for my family and growing in my career and providing value to my professional network and, you know, my clients, my employer. And those things are happening on LinkedIn. And it's a place where people have to censor themselves a little bit because guess what? Yeah. Their professional network and their employer is going to see what they're saying. And so hopefully I think, you know, people think a little bit, yeah. might think twice before <laughs> they just word vomit negativity out of their mouth. Um, yeah. and I prefer not to be around that, to be honest. No, I love it. I, I completely agree. I, I, I had logged out before I started this company, I had logged out of all social media, except for LinkedIn. I, I just, I couldn't deal with it anymore. Uh, yeah. starting the companies and then the podcast, it just necessitated a, a social media 
presence, right? So I logged mm-hmm. back in. Um, but I, I choose not to be on a lot of the platforms uh, personally, right? I, I just, I have my professional profiles that I check. Uh, my wife tags me and stuff on Instagram and Facebook and that way family who doesn't live near here can see stuff, right? Otherwise, yep. uh, to me, it's it's devolved quite a bit. Um, I didn't ask you, Nikki, about Quote Beam. So please yep. uh, tell us about Quote Beam. And specifically, I'm interested, <clears throat> and I think a lot of the listeners would be interested, how uh, a platform, a startup like Quote Beam can affect company culture internally at, at some of your clients. So that, yeah, that's a really interesting point. So what we're trying to build or what we are building, right? Um, I keep saying trying because it, it it's every day, it's a task uh, because a part of what we're doing is changing some culture, some mindset uh, is we're trying to bring together uh, the distribution channels for industrial automation parts. Um, okay. So most, a lot of industrial automation technology is sold through regional distributors that have limited line cards. They support a certain number of manufacturers. <clears throat> they have a specific territory that they're allowed to sell in. Um, and then they, you know, go establish these relationships and help people with their applications, whatever. Um, when COVID came around, and this has always been an issue in our industry, um, I had had a problem with supply chain uh, at a previous company where you order something with an eight-week lead time, then eight week rolls around and oh, my part's not here and my build is stopped. And when right. is that part actually going to come in? Oh, well, now it's actually a 12 week lead time and we hope that's correct from the factory, right? right. COVID and you know, all of the supply chain issues there just exacerbated this in a, in a tremendous way. Um, but we had already been thinking, okay, how do we make it more efficient for machine builders to build machines, let okay. alone quote machines, knowing that they could make a profit at the end of it? Um, because what I had learned is the big guys, you know, have huge databases of things they've already used, right? Particularly OEMs that have somewhat standard machines. Um, but systems integrators and custom machine builders and people trying to do something different, uh, oftentimes they just end up kind of ballparking what their, uh, what their hardware might cost. And at the end of the day, hope they make a profit off of their machine. Because it takes way too long to actually spec and get pricing and availability back from manufacturers or distributors to be able to quote something in a timely manner. Um, Mm -hmm. And this is one of, you know, Roman's problems that he lived through as a machine builder, as an electrical engineer in his early career, uh, was how can you get a complex bill of materials that may be things that you haven't bought before? we found through our research and just talking to you know people that we know in the industry, it will take up to two weeks just to get pricing and availability back on a bill of materials. Um, wow. Working with 50 to 80 different websites or vendors to be able to fully complete and buy that bill of materials at the end of the day. Wow. Um, That's too long. Yeah, it's too long. So A, it's, you know, we are in the automation industry people, right? We're, we're, and and here, you know, basically our process is I have an Excel sheet with my bill of materials and probably spec stuff that I've just used before because going to all the different manufacturers' websites and finding the right technical information, the the product sheets, you know, all of that stuff, it, it can be daunting, right? So you try mm-hmm. to reuse as much of any kind of previous design or hardware you've bought in the past. And then, you know, you work with varying levels of um, expertise of people to try to help you spec the rest of it. And we do recognize, look, regional distributors and high-tech distributors have a huge role to play in mm-hmm. helping customers decide what they need. Because, I mean, engineers are smart, but they there's no way they know everything that's out there. And every right. different manufacturer, all, many of them carry, you know, thousands of part numbers and variations. Um, a huge, I spent about half of my time um, in one of my previous jobs not actually selling anything but just helping my customers navigate what they could actually get on time to complete their project Um, and what trade-offs were acceptable in this material versus that, because if you buy it with this material, the lead time is going to be 12 weeks versus. And so we thought there's got to be a better way to do this procurement. Um, And the phrase we just keep hearing over and over and over is engineers spend way too much time on non-engineering things, including procurement. Sure. Um, because a buyer doesn't know what the heck to buy. They only know how to negotiate a purchase order. It's the engineers right. that really have to figure out what they need. 
Um, so yeah, we wanted to build a platform where you can find all of the automation products that you would need to build a custom machine or production line in one place. That's with awesome. some sort of way to look apples to apples with between different manufacturers. When you just need a certain, you know, some products are, to be honest, are commodities. And then others, you know, they're really not. And it's not always as clear as you would think because, mm -hmm. yeah, circuit breaker is a commodity. But if you work with a, you know, a regional distributor that has knowledge and helps you select the right trip curve and you know that they're going to be there for you if you have a, you know, a warranty issue, right? Then it's all of a sudden not so much a commodity, right? Um, so this kind of interplay between the distribution network and, you know, everybody wants the Amazon style, right? Right. You want to go right. and find something and click and buy it and get it tomorrow. But, oh, uh, all of a sudden there's nobody to support you, right? And right. so the engineering world isn't the place for Amazon in many cases because of that relationship, you know, play. So we really set out to build a platform that allows for collaboration around engineering projects, because really these purchases are projects. They're very mm -hmm. big, involved projects with a lot of different stakeholders. Um, and so we set out to build this platform that connects the regional distribution network to the buyers, to the manufacturers, and allows us to in a hybrid way, collaborate, whether it starts online and goes to in-person or Zoom calls um, or the other way around, you know, being able to click and buy at the end of that process rather than, you know, waiting for somebody to send a PDF purchase order and then waiting two more days to get a, an order acknowledgement back and calling to check up on it three different times. How can we just sure. make this whole process a little bit more uh, streamlined and faster, right? I love buying things from Amazon instead of random vendors that I don't know. Because I don't want to put in my credit card on a random website. I don't know if I trust that website. Right. And I'm not going to remember which one it was when I need to go look up my receipt later, right? Whereas <laughs> with Amazon, I can just go in, I see all my orders, all my invoices. It doesn't really yeah. matter who I bought them from, right? So some of that Amazon, you know, functionality, I think, is vital to any industry trying to become, you know, modern um, or yeah. just stay, stay on top of, you know, how... Stay with the times, I guess, right? Um, but so, do you guys the do you guys then connect? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, that's okay. I was going to say the Amazon model isn't for everything. So we needed to, you know, rather than Uber coming in and pushing out the taxi industry, right? Which a lot of people, including investors and some, you know, people pundits in the industry, will say, well, why do you even need distributors, right? Just buy from the manufacturers directly, and some of the manufacturers right. are selling directly, right? You can click and buy online with the manufacturer's website in some cases. Yep. Um, but there's a whole host of different value that comes from working with a local distributor or regional distributor, somebody that you know and trust that can actually come out to your location, right? That will service you. So that's a big part of the relationship building. Um, but really the short-term need when we entered the market was just people can't find the parts. They're <sighs> on back order. You know, I got quoted 32 weeks or I got no quoted or I ordered this last year and it still hasn't shown up and I have no idea when it's going to show up. And that's when we realized that this regional distributor network, which there's 17,000 independent industrial distributors across North America. That's a lot. Mom and pop shops, right? Regional family owned or employee owned companies that may be doing, you know, five, 10, 50 million. These are... You know, it, the, the definition of what you call them, small businesses, SMBs, right, whatever, it varies. But many of them have not made investments in e-commerce because it's not how the business is done. Mm -hmm. And many of them don't have, you know, ERP systems or things that can make it easy for them to show what they have in stock and make it easy to buy. And so you have to call a local distributor who hopefully you found through the manufacturer's distributor finder if it actually works. Um, and then you have to call them and ask them, do you have this in stock? And it'll take them about two to five minutes to find the right person that can look in the system, that can check the stock for you to see if they have something. If you're in luck, they might have it. And then comes the question, where are you located? Do you have an account with us? And if the uh, answer to either one of those is wrong, then typically you can't even buy the thing. Right. right? And it takes the distributor way too long to set up your account, to get your credit processed all of that to make it worth it for anybody to do this transaction. Um, but if your machine is down or your machine can't ship because you're missing this part, you as the customer, you're going to want to do everything you can to make this transaction work. 
-hmm. It's just a matter of you might have spent two weeks calling everybody that you can find. And maybe you got lucky and found something and then you get your door slammed in your face. It's extremely, <laughs> you know, it's, it's extremely hard and it's hard for everyone. And at the same time, the distributors are inundated with just inquiries. Where's my parts that were supposed to ship last week, you know, right. or two years ago? Uh, and do you have this in stock? What's the price? What's the lead time? Right. And they're just inundated with paperwork and they don't have any time to sell or create relationships. Right. Right. I started in this business calling every regional distributor of a brand that I could find when a customer needed something or a friend um, or a colleague, because I wanted to know how how can it be done? Got it. And I would spend weeks calling distributors and 99 percent of the time they would answer my call, check the stock, answer my question and then hang up the phone. Yeah. Not ask, hey, can you know, why are you calling about this? Can I assist you with anything else? I mean, I, as a salesperson, I'm just horrified. Like <laughs> I just called you willing to buy something and you didn't try to fi find out if I'm a good customer for you or not. Right. But it's just, right. everybody was just way too busy, right? They're way too behind. They're way overloaded um, because you're doing everything in the same, you know, your inbox basically is your triage and it's yeah. full of everything. By now, I don't know a single person whose email inbox is like manageable. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's got to be a better way. So what we started with doing is partnering with regional distributors to make their inventory available online so that machine builders, panel builders, I mean, I don't care who you are, MRO buyer, um, you know, machine is down, you're in maintenance. If that part exists with one of our distributor partners, you can find it on quotebeam.com and you can buy it with a credit wow. card or with net terms um, and you can get it within a week. We're not necessarily, you know, because not everything is in our own warehouse, right? We're, we have a network of regional distributors. Yeah. We're not necessarily, you know, <laughs> if somebody else has one in stock and can ship it same day, you know, our, our right. sweet spot is like it's in stock and you can pretty much get it to your location within a week rather than waiting uh, eight weeks to import it or, you know, who knows how long it might be for waiting for that back order. Um, sure. Sure. But it's, it's, yeah, capturing those long tail relationships that really don't need to be long-term right yeah but to help move our industry forward because we all win when we can automate manufacturing more right i love that uh i was just uh, uh recently uh depending on when this airs or releases uh was having a conversation with chris lukey about uh the paradox of culture and automation, right? Mm -hmm. And how, especially in SMBs, where to me, in my experience, a lot of SMBs, and that's machine shops down to small to medium sized textile manufacturers, it doesn't matter, right? Aren't necessarily culturally ready for automation, right? Is that something that you've seen in, in your experience as well? Yeah, and I, I kind of neglected to answer your the, the culture part of that last question. Um, how is Quopium even involved in, you know, changing culture? But honestly, it's interesting. We go talk to these distributors uh, and some of them, you know, they, they get it right away. They're like, yes, sure. we want, you know, to be able to make more sales. We want to be able to turn our inventory faster. Um, we see the value of connecting with these customers that are outside of our area. Um, and it's not, you know, necessary for us to, hold on to that relationship in all cases, right? Yeah. Where some distributors, I mean, I'm thankfully not in a place where there's enough of them that I don't have to convince, right? That I don't have to, I'm still in that place where if, if we don't, you know, see eye to eye, we don't need to work together. Right. But there are companies out there that have blown my mind with their responses as to why they would not participate in something like Pope Beam. Um, One of them that still sticks with me is, uh, they asked, how will we protect their IP? And I asked, that's a great question. Um, what is your, what do you consider to be your IP? Yeah. Um, and they said, well, our, our book of business, our customer, we don't want our customers to know that they can buy something elsewhere. Hmm. And That's a dangerous uh, place to be. Originally, we used to list distributors and show which inventory they had so that customers could buy from them directly because we thought that, you know, we never wanted to be the middleman in that sense. We wanted to make it easier to transact. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, it's that setting up accounts and so on, it wasn't worth it for everybody involved, right? The customer, in this case, they just want that convenience. Um, 
but they were concerned about having their name show up to up show up next to another distributor of the same product because they were afraid that they would lose their customers for the sole reason that their customer would see another option. Wow. And then later on, uh, a customer came to us, uh, applied for credit, and guess what? They had that distributor and their other <laughs> local distributor already on their credit sheet. I mean, customers <laughs> know they're going to find your competitor, whether you serve it up to them on a platter or not. Yeah. Right. So if we think about the modern ways of marketing, I, I think the best marketing, in my opinion, has a little bit of a point of view. We'll also oftentimes tell you, you know, why a company is not for them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, being, I think, being being transparent a little bit and, and realizing that you can't be all things to everyone oftentimes increases trust in you because at least customers can see, hey, you know what you're good at, right? You're not trying to sell me everything. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of the old thinking is we're going to be the one-stop shop. We're going to do everything and the customer will never go elsewhere because we're going to keep them here somehow, right? Rather yep. than thinking, okay, what can we do to be the go-to for the customer to stay with us, even yeah. in a competitive landscape? Uh, and I think that's a huge kind of cultural shift that I, and I see that between different companies, similar size, similar, you know, type companies. One of them completely has put, you know, gas on the pedal for growth, for did, you know, being in different channels, doing things in new ways. And they're seeing that growth. And then there's a lot of companies that are kind of holding out and saying, no, what we, you know, used to do still works and we want to keep yeah. doing it. But I also see those people struggling to fill positions. Um, and keep people around right interesting um yeah i i used to work for a company um who shall remain nameless but leadership of that company used to say that we needed to build a moat around our business that we needed to be that one-stop shop for our customers and that was about the time that I realized that my values and their values were completely different. And it wasn't the yeah. place for me to be because uh, I, we had a, a great spot in the industry in, in our niche. Um, but we couldn't be everything to everyone. And, and we see that with manufacturers themselves, right. Who don't want to be part of, uh, trade associations, or they don't want their employees to go to trade shows, or they don't want to participate in networking events or mentorship programs, because they're afraid that their people, once they experience the big outside world, are going to leave. Well, they're going to have exposure to that, whether you want them to or not, right? <laughs> um, if, if you're providing that opportunity, then they remember that you're the one who provided that opportunity. They didn't have to go seek it out themselves, right? I, I guess. Although you literally just told me that you have a crappy place to work that people are going to want to leave once right. they know they can, right? And the same thing goes for, I mean, if you think that your customer is just going to chase whatever shiny object if they didn't know it existed, right? Then yep. what type of relationships do you really have with those customers? What 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 have you built your business on? Yeah. If, really your ip is just that your customers can't go elsewhere right and i'm i'm a huge proponent of being a one stop shop in a way right because usually customers if they like you and they have a good relationship with you they don't want to go elsewhere they would yeah. rather do business with those that they already know and like right and they will i mean in our case and i see this a lot I, when i tell people hey this is actually not my area i probably can't get you the best pricing on this or whatever, right? I tell them not to buy from me. Yeah. They'll say, oh, I don't care. I just, you know, I just, if you can handle this, I want to, I want you to do it for me because the context is, it matters a lot. Sometimes yep. people aren't looking for, sometimes they're looking for just straight up the best price, right? Uh, but that is, you know, a small percentage of the time in terms of the types of like relationships and orders and deal things that I deal with. Yeah. Um, so a huge part of what we see quote being, being helpful for as well is helping those organizations that want to be customer centric be the one stop shop for their customers. Got it. But not just because they have everything themselves, but now they're tapped into our network and they can literally fulfill their orders for their customers from our network of other distributors who, oh my, scary thought, are potentially your competitors, right? right? But you actually are solving your customer's problem and keeping the relationship with you 
And guess what? You win because you're now seen as a problem solver rather than a, oh, I advertise to you that I'm the one-stop shop. And then when you can't get something from me, I say, oh, sorry, that's it. Good luck. Yep. You know, like, do you really, if you're going to be the one-stop shop, then act like it. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're not, then to be honest about it, please. And I yeah. think in this day and age, we realize, A, it's also kind of dumb. No, no business owner should buy <laughs> things in only one place. I think supply chain issues have taught us a lot about that as well. If you don't one have some help. diversification in your supplier portfolio, um, you should start looking at that right now. Absolutely. Uh, not for the sake of, you know, I, I think that whole competitive, like, let me pit my suppliers against each other. That's not what it's about either. No. And we went through this thought process a lot when we started the platform. How do we make this a place where we don't just encourage race to the bottom type of behavior? Customers just coming in and requesting quotes from everyone just to go for the lowest price, right? Yeah. That's not the value a platform like ours brings. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of facilitating good relationships that are already good and people that want to prove themselves right and then sometimes you know i personally don't agree with the fact that in a, the way our distribution network is set up in a lot of ways some customers are stuck buying from companies they don't want to do business with only because it's their their option it's their only option yeah and that's where i feel like we need a change of attitude and you know maybe changing of some of the rules of i don't think somebody should ever be forced into doing business with somebody whether it's company or person to person that they don't want to you know yeah um, um well and and i mean you said in your journey uh in the earlier segment you talked about only wanting to do business with people that you enjoy being around right yep. um so how as you're building this platform as you're building something dynamic and what sounds amazing so let me know if you're ever hiring uh how do you balance this this want internally intrinsically yeah. for you that is to do business with people that you enjoy right with being director of partnerships for a startup that is just looking to get more people out there right how do you balance yeah. that that dynamic Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I guess just in my past as a sales engineer for machine vision, if you think about that, um, and yeah. I was everything from the applications engineer to the tech support, it does not serve me to sell a solution to an application that doesn't work in the long run, because sure. they're going to just be calling me for tech support on something <laughs> that doesn't work. It's going to burn my reputation with their suppliers, their customers, their peers, and it's right. going to take up all my time, right? In in the... so. How, yeah, that's, you know, there's a lot of relationships I've kind of left on ice or on the table in terms of partnerships um, that came my way because it maybe isn't the best fit, right? Does it bad add, add the right value to both parties? Um, you know, of course, we have to balance, right? We have goals for growth and things like that. Um, but sure. I think I have associated my personality enough with the company that they're kind of stuck with me now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and people kind of know, like, it, you know, if you're going to be doing business with Quopium, um, we kind of have to jive, right? We're, we're, we need to be looking for some of the similar, some same things, right? Some change in the industry, um, some positivity. Uh, yeah. So, and thankfully it's just, you know, those guys knew what they were getting into when they hired me. Um, Got it. I'm not going to do anything that I don't feel is a good fit. Um, we, we're going to take our time with partnerships. We've, you know, everybody that I'm involved with has, had some experiences, good or bad, in the past in other ways with partnerships. Partnerships can go bad, right? It's one of those things that you have to suss carefully. Um, so we take this angle to it. Um, if we need to have an ironclad contract in writing that our lawyer has to look at to want to be in business together or do a partnerships, a, a partnership, I mean, yeah, then we're not going to do it. Oh, I love that. That's that's the most simplistic way of looking at business ever. If if the a lawyer needs to look at it, then we're not I love that. That's great. Of course we'll still have our lawyer look at it, but if we feel like that's what's gonna protect us, right? Right. Then we've already lost. Wow. And I'm really, really, really happy that I, I work for people that have that same, you know, attitude. We also we chose very carefully who we brought on board as investors, right? So sure. we we're backed by, you know, Silicon Valley VC funds. 
Um, and a number of these funds that wanted to invest in us, A, said either like, just cut out the distributor, you'll make more money. Mm. That was the red flag. We said no. Um, and then we have to look at some realistic growth patterns and goals, right? Of course, we want to be a very big platform. We wouldn't have been able to get investment otherwise. Right. But we chose VCs that we feel have, they understand why we're trying to do this and see that our market is big enough by attacking this problem the way that we want to, the way that serves our industry. Um, and that's why we've also been able to make a few pivots along the way, because we want to truly build something that serves our industry. Um, and sure. we're in a unique position to be what would be considered a kind of a trusted third party. Um, we, you know, are not directly competing with anybody in the space, really. Um, we're, you know, it's a fine line, right? And people sometimes ask, uh, but really, you know, we want to empower these regional distributors and be a platform that allows them and their customers to be more uh, efficient by bringing software tools and automation and collaboration tools to the table. Um, so we really have to be genuine in that because how can anybody trust us to build a platform that works for them if we, you know, are only solely motivated by becoming a unicorn in five years or, right. you know, we wouldn't be trying to tackle this difficult, hairy problem in an industry that needs so much help if we were just looking for a quick buck, because it honestly, yeah. I would have chosen something easier <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I guess culturally easier to, to do, yeah. I think. Than having no, to, you know, talk to seventeen thousand independent companies and see if they're willing to do something differently, um, which is which wow. is a hard road to to go. But we've seen a huge amount of success, and I think a lot of that is being authentic to ourselves and trying to, rather than force our point of view, um, and market ourselves heavily initially, because we've also mm -hmm. changed how we're doing things based on the feedback and things we've observed and tried is to just become that kind of trusted community member um, and really try to build our business on, on that. And then, yeah, having it, having investors that understand that and, you know, ex company executives that understand that to a point yeah. has allowed us to make some of these um, maybe more controversial decisions that other, if looking at myself, having been in a different type of position in the past, I would have had to say yes to some deals that I've said no to um, Got it. in this position. Got it. And it really helps Nick, me sleep at night. Like, honestly. I bet. Uh, I was pretty heavily recruited by another company recently. Um, and one of the things, you know, I, I generally don't even get into a conversation about it um, because I'm so not open to work yeah. uh, elsewhere. Uh, but this was a, a person, a company that, you know, just position that really intrigued me enough to at least have a conversation. And they asked me um, a very thoughtful question, but you know, what, what, makes Nikki happy? What makes you wake up in the morning or what would, right, in a job make you wake up and be happy to go to work and, and want to do this, right? How can we structure a, a, an offer that would really, you know, make you happy? And it was interesting to answer. Uh, and I just, you know, I am really happy. <laughs> I, it's the first time in my career uh, that I can say, you know, I feel like I'm really in the right place. I'm working for the right things, for the right people. I have enough autonomy in my work without being, you know, solely responsible for everything. Sure. And a huge part of that, I think, is that culture fit, that ability to be myself um, and not have to, I don't know, hide my flaws. Like I'm not detail oriented. I used to put that on my resume because somebody in business school said you should say that. I'm like, that's not me. Uh <laughs> When you get to show up as your authentic self both to work and then you really get to authentically represent what you're selling or building a hundred percent, um yeah. it makes a huge difference. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. As as we wrap up here, Nikki, what what haven't I asked you that you want to share uh with the audience today? Any like thought provoking knowledge bombs that you've got for us? Mm. No, I never say things that are that smart. Um, I would, I would say if you're in, if you're not happy, if you don't wake up in the morning, super happy to go to work. And I've been in this position. I know plenty of people that have, right. You get that, you know, Sunday night dreading Monday morning or whatever. I used to get anxiety a lot going to work yeah. um, for different reasons, bosses, projects, you know, whatever. If you, other than occasionally, you know, feel that way or you're not feeling happy um, or fulfilled a part you know think about some personal growth 
right? Because oftentimes it's your own mindset and your attitude and you really can cultivate happiness in yourself regardless of your circumstances because they'll never be perfect. If you're waiting for XYZ to happen to be happy, it will never happen. You won't be happy. Um, There's always the next thing or the next hole to fill. But at the same time, if a lot of that does have to do with the the organization that you work for, the culture Mm -hmm. that's there, or your boss or coworkers that are making, you know, your professional life not happy for you, yeah. then move on. And I don't mean quit your job. Um, my biggest recommendation is start cultivating your own personal brand as you, because then people that actually want to work with you and who you really are will find you yeah. or vice versa, right? If you go out there and you meet enough people, go find something or someone that gets you and how you want to work. And you will be able to find that happy place for you in that industry. You don't have to leave. And I'd say this particularly for women. It's not the entire industry that sucks. It's wherever you're at. Okay. And you can find a better place because there are companies in our industry that care about culture, that want people to feel fulfilled, that want to be able to, you know, open their doors and hire um, diverse people that may be not the norm in that workplace. But if they're not, they're not all there yet and i have no idea like what percentage i would ascribe to companies that have at least a decent or are on their way to a good culture in this industry versus terrible there are terrible ones and you will never be happy there um but the best way to get a job is also not when you need one so try to get out there see what's out there meet other people um and find a company that is a better fit for you And oftentimes you want to talk to somebody else that works there, not just the HR person or the person that's trying to sell you the job because everybody gets sold at all stages of all of our careers, right? Yeah. I've been sold a job by a recruiter, turned out to be not what I expected, right? So Mm -hmm. just think about that. um, And there is always a better place or a way out of that situation. Um, Part of it's you, but part of it can be that you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right, before we go and I read this outro, um, <clears throat> do you want to do a hat swap? Yes, let's do it. Okay. Which one do you want? Okay, so I got purple quilt beam. Okay. And I'm I want the automation out, ladies. I'm currently out of the automation ladies, but we'll we'll have to make a new order soon. So I'll put All you right, on the When list. you make the order, let me know. Um, in the meantime, I will uh, send you uh, hopefully one that people can read better than <laughs> black on dark brown uh leather I'm, patch i'm sure it looks amazing in person oh. it, it looks way better in person it does yeah. uh but i was expecting like the white to be painted on there on the leather so i i didn't oh, okay. necessarily get exactly what i was looking for here but it does yeah. look pretty sweet in person um so if you if you people are considering the swag store buying that hat um Leather always looks better in person than it does on camera. It sure does. Thank you, Nikki. That was that was some marketing maestro stuff there. I love it. Um, so thank you, Nikki, for being on the show. Thanks for stopping by, having a conversation with me. Uh, it was great to catch up both in our previous conversation and today. Um, I actually learned even more today than I had learned the last time we talked. And I think the last time we talked, it was like an hour and a half, almost two hours. It was just an awesome yep. chat. So uh, I really thank you for, for taking the time out of your day, spend some time with me and our listeners. Um, folks, that's a, another episode in the books. Uh, today's journey with Nikki has almost been like hang gliding in the Alps. Um, we dove off of a mountain into the transformative world of automation and manufacturing and how to, at the end, put it all together. And, and Nikki gave some amazing tips on if you're unhappy or you're having those Sunday scaries, I think is what they call them, that anxiety mm. on Sunday. Um, you know, look internally, uh, which I think was is a great first step, but then also uh, build that network, build that personal brand uh, because people will come to you. Um, 
Don't forget that you can continue this thrilling adventure that we're on, on the Manufacturing Culture Podcast on our website. Uh, it's your destination for all things culture in the manufacturing world, loaded with incredible content, if I do say so myself, past episodes, and so coming soon, uh, a community chat type feature where people can talk about culture and cultural issues and uh, do it anonymously if they prefer. Uh, it's something that we've been kicking around. We want to give people the ability to have these conversations, but not feel like they're going to get outed to their boss uh, if they do feel like they're having uh, problems culturally in their facilities. Um, it's just going to be hopefully a, a wonderful place. And again, there is swag there. Uh, massive shout out to uh, our phenomenal sponsor, Spironi. Uh, their commitment to pushing boundaries of innovation in the manufacturing industry is absolutely amazing. Uh, and thank you. A big thanks for your support in making this podcast a reality. Uh, if you're inspired or you felt a spark in listening to today's episode, share the episode with your friends, colleagues, uh, grandma, uh, manufacturing enthusiasts from around the world. Let's spread the energy and keep the momentum going. Um, and I personally want to hear from you. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, please rate and review the show. Uh, your feedback, your thoughts, your comments really have been a, a driving force for the content that we're bringing uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so everybody, until our next episode, stay charged, stay innovative. Remember the culture we cre cultivate today is sculpting the manufacturing world of tomorrow. Thank you very much for tuning in. And I can't wait to bring you more next time on the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Have a great day.